life and biodiversity works is happy to introduce uh, Steve Pelican from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Steve is a professor of mathematics in his real life, but what he really likes to do is walk around looking at bugs, which is coincidentally pretty much what I like to do. Um, he's been studying flies for about 20 years now, I guess, and uh, approaches things from a, a, a scientific perspective, has done a number of interesting studies on flies, and knows far more about them than I do. Uh, I'm very happy to have him uh, agree to, that he agreed to give us a presentation on this subject, and I will turn it over to Steve. You can start sharing whatever you need to share there, and we'll, we'll roll. I, one other thing. Um, I would ask that everybody keep yourselves muted, but if you have a question, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and ask it. Uh, we just need to keep everyone muted to keep the background noise down. But we do want this to be a meeting and you're welcome to chime right in if something needs clarification. Take it, Steve. Okay, exactly. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you. Which, what am I gonna share? Where is it? Um, Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, talk to you for a bit about flies. Um, perhaps the most important and useful thing I can tell you is my email, not my work email, but my real email is in the bottom left and there'll be a recording of everything, but I'm happy to try to help if you come up with questions or answers or uh, issues about flies, um, either as a result of what I've said here today or just as part of your own investigations. Um, my, my, my plan is to uh, try to always have enough time for questions. So as Matt was saying, we're a small enough group, just unmute and, and ask a question if you have them. I probably don't know the answer because there's a lot of things about flies that nobody knows, but uh, my plan is to very quickly summarize what we all know about importance of flies, um, talk a little bit about the diversity of flies, not so much taxonomically and morphologically as uh, in terms of lifestyle and the, the huge variety of niches that they occupy, and then talk a little bit or a fair bit about uh, taxonomy um, not going into details, but a big picture so that when, uh, the way I think about it is when you teach somebody to start birding, the main thing you have to tell them is, do you look in the front of the field guide, the back of the field guide, or the middle of the field guide to find the picture of the bird you're looking at? And so that's what I want to address is a couple of big divisions uh, in the group, in the flies that let you uh, start to focus on things that are related to the, the bug that you're looking at. And then as time allows, uh, talk about a few examples of uh, the process of IDing a fly with an eye to uh, thinking about making, trying to make useful comments about what kinds of uh, things you need in the picture to hope to say something useful about the subject. Um, the more you know about what you're taking a picture of, the more you know what the picture should, should include. Um, but again, there's no hurry. We've got time to ask questions. And I should say up front that I'm not saying all sorts of things that I should. I'm not talking about any associations between flies and plants, either as herbivores or uh, in terms of galls or in, in terms of leaf miner. There's all sorts of stuff that I'm not talking about. I just want to like give you a quick story that uh, so when you walk out tomorrow and see a fly, you'll have new things to think about. That, that's the plan. So very quickly, um, flies are really important. If you uh, meet a species anywhere in the world, there's about a one in six chance or a one in seven chance that it's a fly. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot of species of flies. They're extremely diverse. Um, but they're also very important uh, in, in our lives. I mean, Matt mentioned, you know, 250 uh, million, I, 250 million people get malaria a year. 
or more and 600,000 of them die of malaria. And that's just one species of uh, fly spreading a disease. Um, there's also not so much in the US, but uh, in the tropics, uh, agricultural pet flies are agricultural pests that can be a huge problem. They can wipe out a rice crop in an entire district. And even in Florida, you know, people, uh, citrus growers are always worried about some sort of fly damaging their crop and costing them a bazillion dollars. So they're important economically and we have to pay attention to them for uh, medical reasons. More importantly, of course, they provide all essential services like this uh, little California that uh, parasitizes earthworms, but flies early in the spring and pollinates a lot of early flowering uh, plants. Um, here is just a reminder of some pictures. Upper left is a robber fly eating a horse fly, which is about what it deserves. If you ask me, if you've ever been bitten by a horse fly, that's what they deserve. A uh, robber fly on the right eating a bee fly. Um, and there to remind us that uh, a huge part of the uh, niches that uh, flies fill as, as predators of other arthropods, controlling populations of things that would otherwise, otherwise be pest, pests. In the lower left is a tachinid, uh, a large a representative of a large family of flies that. Uh, Steve, I hate to, hate to cut in, but we've got a couple of requests in the text box. If you could sure. adjust your screen so that just the slide shows so that they'll show up better people are having a hard time seeing. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what people are seeing. Uh, it's, a, it's a split screen with uh, a couple of slides on it. Oh, it's supposed to have one slide. Hmm. Um, hang on. I think you're probably in speaker, speaker view where it's showing you the slide you're, you're looking at, the next slide coming and giving you elapsed time. That looks right. There oh. we go. So, is that better? Yes. I clicked Great. a button. I don't know what it did. But <laughs> <laughs> it's better to be lucky than good. There you go. So, oh, so thanks. Um, if it's okay, then I'll proceed. Uh, Tachinids are parasites, parasites or parasitoids of all sorts of arthropods, especially insects. And again, uh, We would be ankle deep in insects without them. We would be ankle deep in uh, dog poop <laughs> and dead animals if we didn't have other flies that were important in the uh, recycling process. Um, so in terms of diversity, I was saying that, you know, a sixth or a seventh of all the species of animals in the world are, are flies. That's not quite as, as uh, diverse as beetles, but it's up there with wasps. And there's really nothing else, or maybe Lepidoptera, and there's really nothing else compared to them. Flies are so numerous, they fill, they manage to fill every niche that you can imagine. Um, as a comparison, I was just reflecting the other day that there's as many families of flies in, in Ohio as there are species of butterflies and skippers. And for ever I've been interested in going out and photographing all the butterflies and skippers in Ohio. And there's maybe a hundred plus or minus some in a given year and there's that many families of flies and those families frequently have 40 or 60 genera and those some of those genera can have 100 species so there's just way more flies than anybody would be prepared to believe. Um, in terms of diversity then I also want to very quickly summarize but not summarize indicate that the diversity is not taxonomic and, and morphological, but even within a rather homogeneous looking group that we understand to be very similar for all sorts of reasons, um, there's a lot of different lifestyles. Um, so I wanted to talk about the hoverflies or flower flies that are in the family Surfidae, and they all look roughly the same. Their main plan, if you look at any of them, it's a, is, any species is, is a mimic of uh, a hymenopteran, a bee or a, 
wasp or a bee or a wasp primarily. Um, so here's three guys that sort of are believed to be mimics of bees. They're all in one genus. They're all, uh, two of them are the most photographed flies on iNaturalist and people still manage to confuse them um, because they haven't had a chance to look at them carefully. It's the genus Toxomerus and you would think they'd all be roughly the similar and do the same thing. The first two in the top lay their eggs on the stems of plants, the eggs hatch, the larvae eat aphids, a service, many would consider. And so you would think that uh, Mr. Politus at the bottom would do the same thing, but they're totally vegetarian. They lay their eggs on the stems of plants, the larvae crawl up to the flowers and uh, develop feeding on pollen and nectar. Quite different behaviors and uh, metabolically among other things for very similar and very closely related flaws. Um, more surfids, and again, you can sort of probably immediately agree that uh, they all kind of look like bees and wasps. The bumblebee looking guy on the top left is uh, a fly who's, as an adult, it, it takes nectar, but um, its larvae uh, develop in the bulbs of plants like daffodils and tulips and that sort of thing. They're called bulb flies of various sorts of genus Myridon. Upper right is a small fly that hardly anybody ever sees because it doesn't have larvae that live in bulbs or eat aphids or uh, eat nectar. Same family, same hymenopteran uh, mimic, uh, but its uh, larvae develop in sap runs on trees. So you only find them this, this species in the spring when there's sap around. Uh, lower left is a, a bee mimic. Again, uh, it's, it's Microdon, another uh, surfid whose larvae develop in ant mounds. So there's a good chance if you have a, a lot of carpenter ant colonies around, you can find Microdon in June or July and their larvae develop over an entire year in, in a colony of, uh, of ants. And finally, just as sort of further evidence, another bee looking guy, not that different from uh, uh, Toxomerus. This is uh, Aristolus transversa and its strategy for providing for its offspring is not to lay eggs and let them go hunting aphids it lays eggs on the backs of beetles and the eggs wait around for a while and then they hatch and crawl off and eat the eggs that the beetles laid. And so that's a kind of story that sounds goofy and hard to believe, but this is the story you hear over and over again when you learn about the details of uh, the life history of flies. If you can imagine any goofy way, strange, as it may seem, to try to make a living and provide for food for your offspring and shelter for your offspring, there's probably a fly that does it. And that's one of the reasons that it's fun to learn for me to learn the names of flies, because then I can read up on them and learn like a million zillion different stories. So that's all I wanted to say about importance of flies and diversity of flies. Um, there's a lot of them and even if they look roughly the same and have the same plan as adults, uh, their larvae can uh, have uh, completely different, uh, different situations. So I want to tell you a big picture about different kinds of flies. So when you look at one, you know what part of the book, the field guide to look in. I have to admit the field guide, there isn't one, but the field guide, the guide, is about 2,000 pages long because dipterists are serious <laughs> and you don't need to know all that stuff to get on with figuring out enough about who a fly is to learn about it and communicate with other people about it. So the main division among all of our flies is whether they have a short antenna or a long antenna. And this was, uh, 
this short antenna uh, arose about, about 250 million years ago uh, in the evolution of, of flies. So the division is between what uh, dipterists called the brachycera or short antenna flies and the nematocera, which stands, it's in quotes on that slide because it stands for all the others. If they don't have short antenna, then they're all the others. The brachycera are believed to be a single lineage derived from one common ancestor who had a really good idea of having a short antenna. And there's a lot of different lineages represented in the nematocera. But uh, I think you can agree the guy on the right, which is a, who's a wood gnat, uh, no, it's a girl. Um, there's a gap between the eyes at the top of the head. So this is a female, has, has long antenna and they're made up of a lot of very similar looking units that are independent. It can wiggle its antennae. On the left, there's basically three parts to each antenna. You can't see the details, but it's not a repetition of many, many identical parts. That's the, the distinction I'm talking about. Short antenna versus long antenna. Um, among the long antenna flies, along, among the nematocerin are things that I think you're probably familiar with, like crane, crane flies in the bottom right. Again, you can see a long antenna made up of a lot of identical units. Um, often they their larvae develop in moist soils or rotting wood or that sort of thing. Um, and they may eat microorganisms or they may be predatory. Uh, upper right is a uh, fungus gnat. Many of the species in that uh, group have larvae that develop in fungi or rotting fungi. Uh, top middle is a you know, as a drain fly, you probably have seen them in your kitchen if you've been out of the house and there's been water in the drain for a while. These psychotids uh, will get through a couple generations. You'll have a little bloom of these very pretty feathery looking guys that are a couple millimeters long. Um, they're easy to appreciate here. They're the same family of the sand flies that spread Leishmaniasis. And so we're lucky we don't have that sort of thing around here because they're medically important in other parts of the world. And finally, you can see this Bibionid, a uh, March fly in the, on the left, again, has an antenna that's made up of a whole lot, at least eight <laughs> of uh, similar units. This, the, these nematocerans are all in contrast with the Brachycera, uh, derived from a common ancestor about 250 million years ago. And here's a couple of examples of them. Uh, perhaps the thing you need to see first is the uh, deer fly in the upper right. You might say that that guy has a long antenna and indeed it is long, but if you look at it, it's made up of three parts. And maybe that final part is made up of a few little things, but it isn't a long string of identical parts. So it's one of the brachycera. It's a uh, horse fly. Upper left is again a fly that uh, ha has three parts to an its antenna. Lower left is a fly in a family that's devoted its entire life to eyes. The entire head is covered with an eye, related to the uh, hoverflies that I was showing you a while ago. And then a blowfly, a califorid, uh, responsible for cleaning up dead, uh, dead chipmunks that feral cats leave lying around and dog poop and that sort of thing. All of them have short antennae. You don't have to see the details of them to see that they're short and not nematocerans. They're all brachycerans. And going forward, I'm only gonna talk about brachycerans because we separated them out as important and the old guys, the, the, the nematocerans, oh, we've separated them out. So I wanna talk about them in a minute, but first there's a quiz. It's the only quiz. 
having working at a university have to get a quiz or they don't like reappoint me or something. But uh, here's a quiz. Two flies that look sort of the same. They're about the same size. They kind of got orange legs. They also sort of have oranges scutum. One's a little darker and one's a little lighter and they both have darkish wings. What's the difference? Who's who? Go ahead, somebody speak up. I'll bite. Yeah, Luann's got it. The top one has long antennae. It's a, it's a exactly. March, March fly. Exactly. Um, the guy on the top, you don't have to see it in a microscope. You can see it almost from across the room or in binoculars from a, a slight distance. Um, it has an antenna made up of a lot of identical segments. So it's an nematocerin. And the other guy, you can't see the details of its antenna. I could blow it up, but it isn't an nematocerin. And so it's a short, short antenna fly. And that tells you whether you look in volume one or volume two of the book of flies. <laughs> Nematocerans are in one, one, one group and, and uh, the brachycerans are in the other. Long intended and short intended, or long horned and short horned. Um, the next innovation I have to tell you about is something that happened with the larvae of the short, short horned, the brachycerin flies, um, popularly known as maggots. Um, and the distinction, which turned out to be a really big deal, happened about 150 million years ago. Um, on the right is a sort of generic larva, uh, a generic pupa of a generic fly. Um, it looks the same as the larva. They shed their skin and the larva eats more and grows and sheds its skin and eats more and grows. And then it pupates, it gets a little torpid, doesn't move around so much. And then the skin on the back of that uh, pupa breaks open and the adult crawls out and, and flies away. And that's the pattern for a lot of flies, all of the nematocerans and some of the short antennaed flies. But this new innovation you can see on the left is, that's a picture of a house fly. But it's a house fly that's just emerging from its pupal case. And its pupal case is the thing that I'm talking about that's, that's special in an innovation. It's not just a sluggish larva, it's a specially developed, modified larval skin called a puparium that's hard and uh, impervious to water, it retains water and uh, it prevents mold because it's so rigid and sclerotized. And it's so hard to get out of that uh, most the, the, uh, a circular seam around one end of that cylinder, that reddish, orangish brown cylinder, was included in the design. And so the name Cyclorapha for the guys with the flies with this in a innovative uh, property refers to a circular seam in the case in which the, meta the metamorphosing pupa lives. And this particular housefly doesn't look like, like a housefly. You don't usually see them with their airbag expanded, but uh, an adaptation that came along with the cyclorapha uh, development is that there's a gap in the heads of all of the flies I'm talking about now through which they can ex evert an uh, airbag, well, it's actually filled with fluids, and push open along the circular seam, the case of uh, uh, that larval case, that puparium. So that's the second big distinction. The first big distinction is short antennae versus big antennae. The second distinction is hard pupil case with a circular seam and usually special adaptations to help the flies bust out of it. Um, that doesn't look like a house fly because within minutes of emerging, uh, that uh, telenum, as it's called, is retracted into the head and the fly inflates its wings and they dry out and turn rigid and it flies away. But this was a huge deal 
and the distinction between the guys that have it and the guys that don't is some of them thought to be a single lineage derived from a common ancestor are called the cyclorapha or circular seamed flies. And the others are everybody else in quotes. Some people call them orthorapha. It doesn't matter. They're everybody else. So I'll kind of indicate a few examples of each of these, but we're working towards understanding who the cyclorapha's are. Some of the non-circular seamed flies are the robber flies in the upper left and the bee flies in the lower right. Robber flies, you've probably seen flying around, they're marvelous predators. They fly about as fast as any fly. They catch stuff on the wing. You can see the legs of that fly are kind of adapted to become a cage that it can just grab a really big insect. And then it has a pointy mouth part to stab it to death and suck all the good stuff out. Um, the bee flies on the lower right, which are another lineage of orthoraphans, uh, are primarily uh, parasitoids. And you'll see most of them flying around close to the ground, laying eggs near where other grasshoppers are laying eggs or bees are burrowing, burrowing into uh, sand or wasps are uh, excavating to uh, lay eggs and provision larvae. So bee flies are parasitoids and the uh, robber flies or asylids are, are major predators. More orthoraphans are horse flies that unfortunately everybody knows about and uh, soldier flies, fairly closely related to the horse flies, but primarily uh, with larvae feeding on compost and rotting type stuff. Although some are predators, mostly of uh, other larvae and that sort of thing. And then finally, some more orthoraphans, uh, long-legged and dance flies, starting the first really warm days when there are leaves open, you'll see uh, guys like the thing on the left running around on the surface of leaves in the sun. They're long-legged or uh, dolichopoded flies, one of the most diverse groups of non-cyclorathan flies. All of these guys are predators and the guy, the impid, impidid D on, uh, on the right, you can see sort of has, is much smaller than most uh, robber flies we know, but it sort of has this cage-like design and specially designed legs for grabbing things. So it's a predator, although you can't see its mouth parts. They're also very pointy and good at stabbing. And that's a, 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 a fly uh, whose species name is Ohioensis. So it was described from Ohio. In contrast to all of those orthoraphans, are these guys the circular seamed flies? an innovation that appeared about 150 million years ago, as opposed to the short antenna, which is 250 million years ago. Um, uh, key examples are blowflies on the right and tachinids on the left. Properties that are very common among these guys are these white structures that sort of mediate the connection between the bases of the wings and the body called calipters, and so these are calypterate cyclorathans. Not all cyclorathans are calypterate, but these guys are. When you see those white calipters, <laughs> you know you're looking at a cyclorathan. You don't have to understand the details of the life of its larvae and pupae to know that what you're looking at. Other cyclorathans, uh, there's a guy on the left, you can see it, it's a fruit fly. Uh, you can see it doesn't have conspicuous calipters. It does have small antennae, three-parted antennae, so it's a brachycera and a short antennae fly. You don't really know how to tell it from an orthoraphan, except for this picture on the right, which is a fly I haven't identified, I don't even know what family it's in, 
but I can tell you that it's a cyclorathom because as I was telling you, a common structure uh, related to uh, this special puparium with the circular seam is that a lot of flies, a lot of cyclorathons evert this, uh, I think of it as an airbag to break the pupil case open. And that telenum comes out of a seam on the head, which then closes up uh, and it never needs its telenum again. But this upside down U-shaped structure on the face of this fly is called the lunule. And that's the marks the gap where the telenum, telenum was uh, everted. And so when you see that sort of structure, you know you're looking at a cyclorathon and even one that has a telenum. If I had a picture of this uh, tephrida, this uh, fruit fly from the front, you would see that it has one of these U-shaped structures. And all of the horse flies and calliphorids and all of the calliphorid flies have that proper. So that's uh, that, that property. So that's the distinction between the cyclorathons and the non-cyclorathons. So, uh, I'll stop and see if any, I, I use a lot of sort of Latinate words. I'll stop in for a second to see if anybody has any questions that I should go over or clarify. You, you've used the term parasitoid a couple of times. Maybe you could clarify that one Ah, pretty quickly. Okay, so a, a species of, is a parasitoid of another species if it sort of behaves like a, parasite in that it infects or lives in uh, the other species and ends up killing it by consuming it, generally from the inside, sometimes externally. A parasite, as opposed to a parasitoid, tries to live with its host forever. It may not kill it, it just tries to make a living uh, as a parasite. Parasitoids are basically internal predation. They're, they're killing their host in the process of consuming them. And it's the way most flies, uh, there are very few fly parasites, let me say, most are parasitoids. Did that sort of explain it? Is it sort of correct? <laughs> that, that's, that's the way I think about it in any case. So the, the final thing I wanna do before, uh, really asking you for questions is to just talk a couple about a couple of situations uh, where you might wanna be inclined to try to identify flying and knowing a little bit about them in advance tells you what you might want a picture of or what you need to know to make further progress on identification. So the first example that I wanted to talk about is a nematocerin. So, You'll see it has long antennae, right? You don't have to have a microscope to, to see that that antenna the, and the antennae of these guys are made up of a large number of repeated, very similar units. These guys happen to be mosquitoes. And so I'm talking, using them as an example about what you think about when you try to photograph a nematocerin and what kind of goes on when you try to find out what sort of fly it is and what its name is. Uh, the, these, these mosquitoes are both of genera that you can identify from this photograph to genus. The guy on the top, the guy, they're both females. Um, the guy, the fly on the top with a pointy abdomen that comes to a, a very sharp point is what most people used to call genus Aedes. Um, this is species you can actually identify to species from this picture is Aedes vexens, the most common biting Aedes in uh, Eastern North America. And it's enough to identify it to see this very pointy abdomen, some bands on some of the tarsi, I'll explain that in a minute, and a little bit about the light colored scales on the side of the thorax. That's enough to identify this to species. This is unusual with nematocerans, uh, 
but it's an important example. Um, I'll talk about fly legs again in a minute, but uh, they have parts that correspond and are named uh, similarly to our thigh or femur and our shin or tibia and the rest of these segments along that thing are called tarsi or foot. There are, we have bones in our feet called tarsi as well. So there's a thigh and a tibia and then feet. And so if you were talking to an adipterist and trying to impress them, you say, yes, it was a nematocerin with a attenuated pointy abdomen. And then I noticed white banding on the bases, bases the lower inner part of the tarsi. And the dipterus said, oh, was that an 80s vexans? Very fortunate we can make an identification uh, of a nematocerin with a, with a photograph. A question from Luann, Steve. She, oh. she wonders about the habit of holding their legs, the hind legs up like that. They do that. They do that. <laughs> do all of them do it? Um, uh, all of these species, the, the, these genera that I'm talking about, the guy on the top is Aedes, the one on the bottom is Culex. I'll say a bit about that in a minute. There are others that don't, and in particular Anopheles have a completely different posture. They look like a drilling rig. Their feet are all planted and their butt is up high and their uh, proboscis is pointed straight down where they're gonna bite into your capillary. But that's fairly, this, this uh, raised legs is a fairly common posture. The one on the bottom is really the point of, of this slide. It's another dermatocerin. It's, you can agree it's a mosquito. This is uh, genus Culex, and you can tell that because it has a rounded abdomen instead of a pointy abdomen. And this uh, Culex is about to lay a batch of eggs. You can see she's uh, developed a good collection of eggs. And amazingly, Although some 80s, the common ones you can identify from a picture, not even a great picture. These guys, people will argue about all day. The experts will argue about because you can't actually identify an adult Culex, period. Uh, the way people identify them is you have to find larvae. Larvae are very important. They're often aquatic among the nematocerans and look at the end where there is a siphon and anal structure and details of hairs and scales there are what tell you that this is not Culex pipiens, the most common, but Culex restuans. And I told people that I had Culex restuans in, in my yard back when uh, West Nile was a thing, because these guys are capable of spreading West Nile. And they said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. It's a house mosquito, it's Culex pipiens, until I learned how to make slides and <laughs> took a picture of a slide and said, oh, okay, you're right. Nematocerans, some of them are very hard to identify as adults. And knowing about the larvae are important. Another example is the chironomids or uh, non-biting midges. Uh, there are species that have been described only in terms of the larva, and nobody even knows what the adults look like. They're the genus Chironomus, which this male in the upper right uh, is, is, a, is in the genus Chironomus, um, is, a, is a rather large genus, and people just don't know how to identify them unless you're part of a small team that's slowly associating details of the adults with the well-known details of the larvae. Um, you've probably seen these guys in shallow or, or turbid water. They're called bloodworms. The larvae are called bloodworms. They have a chemical like hem our hemoglobin that helps them get oxygen even in slightly ano fairly anoxic uh, uh, settings. But again, a tabanid uh, sorry, <laughs> a nematocerin with long, repetitive antennae, an adult that uh, you can tell is a chiron chironomid because it has a very short femur and a very short tibia. And then the first 
tarsomere is longer than the tibia. And that's sort of typical. And if you see uh, nematocerin with that property, you're looking at a chironomy. And you probably can't identify it unless you find the larvae <laughs> or unless you get lucky. That's just the way it is. A lot of flies, we just can't identify the species unless it's really important and we invest a lot of effort on it. So that's my first example about identifying stuff. Um, that sometimes you get lucky and there's something distinctive or it's a well-known uh, species, but even for very common and medically important organisms like uh, the culicids that can spread West Nile and Zika and a bunch of other viral diseases, you have to find the larvae and, and use a real microscope to figure it out. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't just take a picture and say, that's Culex, I'm really happy. That's a fine, fine approach to the problem. Chironomy is the same thing. So as a second example of identifying something, I wanted to tell you my favorite personal identification success, which took about eight years or 10 years to do. And um, part of the story, the reason I want to tell you this story is uh, the take home from it is that experts are really friendly. Dipterists love anybody who will ask them any question about a fly and answer <laughs> and, and listen to their answer to it. So uh, this is a fly that I didn't collect. It was collected by a guy named uh, Chris Thompson, who was like the world's expert on hoverflies. And he was doing a workshop out in Adams County, a couple counties east of here on hoverflies, but he took everybody out in the yard and showed them how to use an insect net to cl collect flies. And he collected this thing, which is not a hoverfly. And I said, that's interesting, can I have it? And he grabbed a pin, insect pin, and stuck it in it and handed it to me. He said, sure, let me know if you find out what it is. Um, it's green, it's got long legs, it has short antennae, three-parted antennae, so it's a brachycerin. That's half the fly is gone in terms of worrying about identifying it. It's a brachycerin you can't see from the front, but it doesn't have a lunule. So it's uh, actually not even a cycloraphin. And making that decision is kind of hard, but this is a long-legged fly, a dolichopoded, the sort of little green flies that you see running around on leaves in, in the warm season. Um, and what's unusual about this is there aren't many of these guys that have a dark patch on their wing. And so I was learning about this family of flies and I said, man, this is a great thing. It's got some distinctive features. And if you find a fly with distinctive features, maybe you'll get lucky and be able to identify it. Um, so I worked on it for a while. I used a paper uh, by Fanduzi and Curran from 1934, which is a key, a, a taxonomic key, to help you identify all of the species in the genus Dolichopus, which is what this fly belongs to, based on characters that I'll, I'll, I'll maybe mention in a minute. Um, the uh, Fanduzi and Curran treats about 300 species in the genus. So it's a major project to try to figure something out. I went through that key very carefully and couldn't f or ever arrive at a species identification for this thing because there just aren't any Dolichopus, any in the genus that have that dark patch and, and have this sort of uh, hypopigial lamella or have an antenna that look like that. And so I did what I hope you would do when you can find an uh, interesting fly and get a picture of it and want to try to figure it out and you can't. I went to bug guide and then I went to diptera.info and asked experts. I asked an expert uh, from uh, St. Petersburg. I, I'm, I, I think this is genus Dolichopus, but it doesn't key out to anything that's at all like that. And he said, oh, the genus is right. Don't worry about it. Try again. 
Um, I consulted a guy in, at MIT who said, maybe it isn't that genus, but the guy from St. Petersburg said, yes, it is. And I told him, yes, it was because there are little bumps down here on that picture. Um, finally, a guy from uh, another Dolokopoded expert from uh, Switzerland said, maybe it's a newer species. You have to look at all the literature since 1934. And that took about six years <laughs> doing bibliographic searches and, until I found this paper from 1939 describing a new species of Dolocopus and with a wing that looks like this, an antenna that looks like that, and a male clasping part that looks like that. This is a perfect match for this thing. So I posted and everybody said, congratulations. The, the, so I was really happy and proud, proud of that. But the point of the story is maybe you won't even be able to identify something to species. It's a really hard process. I mean, it, it's not hard, it's fun and entertaining, but there's a lot of people who will help you do it. And uh, when you actually figure something out like that, it's really quite exciting. And you tend to tell strangers about it during Zoom meetings. <laughs> Um, finally, the next to the last thing I wanted to talk about is another just identification example. Once you know sort of what kind of fly you're looking at, then you know what you need pictures of. This is another example of a robber fly. If you look at its antenna here, you can see it's got three parts to it, a base, a middle, and an end. It hasn't, so this is a brachycerin even though its antenna is sort of long, it's not large number of repetitions of identical flagellomeres. It's got three parts, a pedicel and a scape and a arista or whatever their names are in this particular group of flies. But we know it's a short family, a, a short antenna fly. There is no lunule, a, no little gap or U-shaped crevice around the face of this thing. So it's not a cycloraffin. It's one of the orthoraffins. Uh, so very quickly you can determine it's a robber fly in addition to noting the fact that it's got this, these cage-like legs and a really pointy mouth. And so as you might expect, the things that are important in the life of a fly are the things that get differentiated and are important in identification. So this is something that flies around. So we expect to need a picture of its wing to identify it and it grabs other things. So we expect that its legs are gonna be special and the way it moves its legs are special. And that's exactly the pictures you need to identify this to genus, Omadius. Nobody knows what species it is, uh, probably can't decide, but you need to know something about the legs and flies have a lot of bristles and bristles on legs in an organism that makes its living by grabbing things with legs are probably important and so taxonomically you expect that you want a picture of that. The mouth part might be interesting but it doesn't seem to be important here. The wing I'll say in a little bit about in a minute and also the sort of skeletal structures related to the bases of the legs are very important because these flies can move their legs a lot more than most flies can to get it so they can get a grip on and catch rather large items of prey. Um, so these pictures are enough to identify the, uh, the fly Usually a picture of a wing with the veins is, is useful beyond knowing that it's a short antenna to fly. You need to know something about the veins in the wing to uh, make progress in identification. This got lucky because after a few things like the fact that this vein that splits here and comes off and rejoins it before the edge of the wing, made it easy to identify this particular robber fly to genus and nobody can go any farther than that. So again, 
uh, we can find out something about the fly because we know its genus and we can learn, are the adults flying all season or at, at, uh, for a short period during the year? Other stuff that's sort of important about it. But uh, you'll surely want to talk about the pectinate antennae also. That's because that's enough to identify the genus. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll pass. What Matt's talking about is you can see that these, this arista at the end of the antenna has little feathery uh, attachments to it. The picture doesn't really illustrate it, but that's again an example of, if you take a, pictures of enough flies, you'll find something that's distinctive and like a spot on the end of the wing or a feathery antenna, which will help you not identify every fly, but you might get lucky and make progress on one of the flies. Finally, one last example uh, is um, yesterday, Matt sent me an email saying, I saw my first gonia of the year, because I guess he went out in the front yard and, and it wasn't raining. And so he saw a fly that looked like this. And for all of the big words and Latin sounding words, uh, I wanted to remind you, that's just dictionary. You can figure out what that means. But when Matt said he saw a gonia, I knew it was diptera. I knew it was a fly and I knew it was cyclorapha. So, it's got a funny pupa, but it also has a lunule here. That's what this schizophora. And tachinid, once you know that agonia, agonias are tachinids, you know that they're parasit, they're larvae or parasitoids. So you start to know something about the fly. And just before we started, I said, gee, they are out early. People report seeing gonia very early all the time, but it's a fairly big fly. It's a centimeter long or a little bit more. What is What caterpillars or larvae is it feeding on? And by having a name, not even an identify, identification to species, because there's like 30 species and there's not enough to, Matt didn't tell me enough to identify it. Knowing a genus, I can look it up just Google it and say, oh, well, these flies are do sort of uh, the, the uh, Aristolus transversa thing. They lay their eggs where there is going to be prey eventually and the prey waits. And rather than on the back of a beetle, they lay their eggs on a leaf and then, then wait, the eggs wait for a caterpillar to ingest them in the process of eating the leaf. And then they hatch out and parasitize the larva of the presumably moth that uh, ate them. So I'm not an identification expert at all, but the fact that uh, I had a name, even though it's not a complete identification, it was enough to find a lot of interesting things about a fly. And I'll have to look up later to try to find out what kind of caterpillars <laughs> is it hoping to be eaten by. So I think that's all I had for you guys. And I think I came, I hope I came in under an hour, um, but I'm also happy to uh, either try to answer questions or go into more details about anything uh, that would be helpful to you. Is there something I should talk about more or you wanna ask about? Uh, feel free to chime in people. Just unmute yourself, no need to use the chat box. How do you catch flies, says Sharon. <laughs> um, that's an excellent question. Um, the way most people catch flies is with traps. Catching them individually in a net takes a lot of time and unless you're really good, you, you miss a lot of them. So a very, quick and easy way to catch flies and start looking at them is to get little plastic picnic uh, wear, yellow plastic bowls and put soapy water in them and put them along a roadside or a path side in sunny areas. And flies will conveniently drown themselves in that soapy water and then you can take them out and look at them. 
the other way that one catches flies is with a, something called a malaise trap, which is a, a puff tent, except it doesn't have sides, it has a divider in the middle. So it's a roof and a divider in the middle. And uh, what happens is flies flying along will blunder into this divider. And when a fly meets a obstruction, it tends to go up. A beetle tends to drop to the ground, a fly and a wasp tend to go up. And so you put a collector at the top of this pup tent and it's a little jar and flies all crawl into the jar and wait for you to come take them home and look at them. So those are the two ways that people catch flies a lot is water traps, which I guess um, some people that, were, that Matt was talking to were using to sample bees a while ago. Yeah, it's a pretty common common way of catching anything that's attracted to flowers because the 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 colored bowl looks enough like a flower to make them land on it. So so this is an opportunity because somebody who's doing water traps for bees is also catching flies and they don't want them. So if you get friendly with them, they'll give them to you. <laughs> um, have, and, have a question from from Pat Brown here. Okay. Um, we think of a group of mosquitoes as being very similar to each other. Um, how does that compare to the difference among primates, for example? How closely, just in terms of the, clo the closeness of the relationships within a group of mos like mosquitoes? It's uh, well, in the, in the U.S. Or, or in the eastern U.S., there's maybe five genera of mosquitoes. We saw Aedes and Culex, and there's Serophora and a, a couple others. Um, if you go to uh, eastern Bra southeastern Brazil, there is about five genera of primates, maybe eight or ten, that you'd expect to encounter. So all of the primates in a place where there is a fair number of primates are about as numerous and diverse as all of the mosquitoes in Eastern North America? That's an approximate answer, but it's, I think it's sort of reasonable. It's, it's a very hard question to... to but but mosquito, mosquitoes are a family and primates are a family taxonomically, right? Yes. So an another question um, about the evolution of the bee-like characteristics of hoverflies. Yeah. How did what what what's the evol evolutionary motivation behind that? Uh, so the, it's thought to be mimics of a lot of potential predators of flies uh, have encountered stinging bees or wasps in the past and have uh, maybe learned to avoid trying to swallow them whole, for instance. Um, and so uh, this is thought to be uh, a mimicry in which the, the model is obnoxious, a stinging hymenopteran, and the mimic isn't deleterious or unpleasant, but it kind of gets an advantage by looking like a, one of the bad boys. It was thought to have evolved in hoverflies several times. You know, there's wasp-looking ones and and uh, bee-looking ones, and they and they now think that those have uh, arose differently rather than an original ancestor that said, "I am an archetypal mimic of Hymenopteron and will radiate from there, or di diverge from there." Did, did that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think you're you're basically saying that they 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 gain they gain protection by looking like something that could sting. So yes, exactly. Another question about uh, basic evolutionary evolutionary things. Um, where did the question reads? Um, did flies evolve from fish like we did? But I'm gonna kind of rephrase that and say, where did our lineage break off from the lineage that produced flies in evolutionary terms? Oh, so arthropods and uh, 
the earliest two-winged flies that we know about, I think, are about the, about 300 million years ago. And what's that? Jurassic, some somewhere like that. Um, mammals didn't come along uh, until much more recently. So the the lineage of the, the common ancestor of all of our flies is was around several hundred million years ago before the common ancestor of, of uh, all of the mammals. Of the vertebrates. Uh, yeah, there were vertebrates around then, but uh, there certainly weren't mammals as we know them. I don't know if that answered the question. I could try again. Yeah, it's a tough question. Well, I just, it's just that I um, was fascinated that so many different types of creatures have the same kind of leg structure, even though it looks completely different. And when you were describing their legs and the tarsi, and that is so interesting, and it appears differently with all sorts of animals and insects and things like that. So I just wondered if there was like, since we have a background as being fish, <laughs> um, I just wondered if they did as well. Um, oh, okay. So I can maybe say something a little bit more. All of, all of these flies and stuff are arthropods. Uh, they're, they don't have backbones. They're not vertebrates. Um, their common ancestor was, we believe, sort of worm-like, a sequence of segments and uh, that were nearly identical. And as evolution uh, proceeded, uh, we ended up with things like flies. But if you look at the, can I share, am I sharing this now you're, or not? You're, you're still sharing, I think, yeah. Okay. Um, this fly, you can see its abdomen is made up of sort of a batch of segments lined up against each other. Its thorax chest is made up of a batch of segments, three actually, that are sequenced one after the other and then continue on to the segments of, uh, of the abdomen. The head is actually considered a sequence of segments, body segments, and the appendages that make up the mouth parts are analogous and, and homologous to the legs, which are two extrusions of the thoracic segments. And so this is uh, all of the insects, all of the arthropods we look at, we think of as a sequence of segments. Their ancestors had just a zillion segments that were all identical. And as they evolved groups of segments, developed things like legs or wings and that sort of stuff. But the body plan for these guys is, is quite different from the fish and, and the vertebrates. Any other questions? If not, then let me say, I hope you feel confident you can go out and have fun looking at flies when you do send me an email, take a picture and you can post on, should I show that page? Maybe I'll tell you one final uh, reference, one final thing. You might know this, but uh, the websites that I find most useful for looking at flies are diptera.info. That's where the experts hang out. That's where I got help for that dollar capoted. Um, uh, bug guide tends to be a little more useful for identifying flies than iNaturalist because there's some specialists who spend more time on bug guide than iNaturalist. So if you have a picture, you want to put it on iNat so that people know that it's there and can start thinking about it. But if you want help with identification, the first thing to try is bug guide. And if that doesn't work, then move to Dipter Info. Um, the other thing I should say is there are some good uh, books. Stephen Marshall's a well-known Dipterist. I think this is like a, a library coffee table book 
type thing, meaning it's expensive and you want to get it from the library, but it has a lot of nice colorful photographs. There's a lot of uh, serious amateur naturalists around. And so some paperback uh, thing like a dipterous handbook that has a lot of chapters about how to collect flies, how to identify them, how to store them, how to trap them, uh, that sort of thing from an anti amateur entomologist society is a good thing. And then this Manual of the Arctic Diptera, that's three volumes, 2000 pages, um, has the advantage that Agriculture Canada makes it available for free. So you can download PDFs with all of the information although I'm not good enough to use all that information, to identify the genus, any of the flies in the, in the Arctic. So sure. MN, MND is, is the, a reference that has a lot of great uh, black and white illustrations and it's free to download. In the same way that uh, the field guides for butterflies and dragonflies have improved incredibly over the last 20 or 30 years, there are now starting to be uh, workable field guides for some fly groups. Um, here is one on surfed flies. Princeton, that yeah. Came out, yeah, it came out the last year or so. And, you know, it almost kind of looks like a, a, a bird field guide inside. Um, so the, 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 the sort of popularization of flies is actually underway. Uh, I would encourage people to put things up on iNaturalist because that's the easiest way to contribute your, your uh, information to the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life project there. And uh, I'll certainly take a stab at identifying them. Uh, there are some pretty good fly people who check in pretty regularly on Massachusetts flies. So you're likely to get some help. Um, I, thanks again, Steve. That was a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Uh, I appreciate all of you joining us for the uh, event this evening. I hope it inspires you and, and gives you a little bit of uh, starting material to pay more attention to this very fascinating group. I'm going to stop yeah. recording at this point and uh, we'll sign off. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. 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 Th